This is the ninth presentation, guiding people as they pray through the book, The Ignatian Adventure. So it's about the passion of Jesus, the third week of the exercises. Now again, I say, this is to help you pray your retreat. This is not a retreat, I keep saying that, but I've got to say it. You are making the exercises according, along with that book, and I would like to help you. So we are in the passion of Jesus. The word passion actually comes, is rooted in the same word as patient, meaning someone who is sick. But someone who is sick is actually one who is receptive. The word patsior is I, I receive. So it's how Jesus received life. Uh, compassion, we pray for the grace of compassion to be with receptivity as Jesus was. We have said that Jesus at his baptism listened. He lived obediently. In a way, his whole life is one event of the same experience of being who he is. He was obedient to who his father said he was. You are my beloved which made him very available to everything. And I'm gonna say something a little difficult. Jesus' suffering and death on the cross is in a way nothing new. It's the same interior of receptivity, of openness to. He lived passionately, receptively, eagerly, energetically, that's what passion means. As he gets closer to the cross, he gets closer and closer to the expression of who he really is. The full expression of his identity, that he is really receptive even to death, even to death on the cross, as it says in the second chapter of Philippians. Here's another strange way to say it. Jesus lived gratefully what he was asked to receive. So that we were, we were saved, and you can read this in the fifth chapter of Romans, we were saved by an act of obedience contradicting, contradicting the uh, disobedience of Adam. Uh, so he lived gratefully, and he was grateful even for his death because he was grateful for who he was. Even at the cost of losing what he knew to be a precious life. So how to pray with this, this receptivity. We, in the exercises, we are asked to go not only to the events, to the external, but to the interior. We've talked about this before. What was the interior of Jesus? Now we, maybe you have been at the bedside of someone who is dying. And it is a very, very humbling and uh, poverty experience. You can't do anything. You can straighten the bed clothes, change the blinds, get some water, but you are poor at a time in which you'd really like to be able to do something life-giving. That's who we are with Jesus. We can't do anything as we pray with it, except to be conformed to his interior spirit. And so we, in our prayer these days, we will try to accompany Jesus in his suffering and in our awareness of that his brothers and sisters are suffering. And if, if, if we get, get close to the cross, we are getting close to what he's saying about all his brothers and sisters. They're my brothers and sisters. 
and we get close, but we, we don't like the poverty, the inability that we have to do anything about the poor, the sick, the needy, the excluded. Let somebody else do that. No, his interior was, I will, I will be with them. And he looks at us and says, can you pick up the cross of your poverty? And, and see the, the, the hardness of heart that is within racism, exclusions, judging, prejudicing. Those are his brothers and sisters. You see, what we're praying with is that Jesus consummates his life on the cross. But there's, there's nothing new, it's, it's the same Jesus. He was available to foreigners, to sinners, to lepers, all that was excludable, he included. And then he looks and says, can you, can you have that interior when you pray? Can you pray for that interior? That's hard. So the cross is the final objectification of who he is. And he's on the cross and he's looking down. And, and, and as you pray toward, and, and uh, O'Brien, you will see, has many uh, scriptural citations. Um, to, to go slowly, go slowly. Don't hurry, there's no, Jesus did not hurry carrying his cross. And he hung on his cross slowly, patiently. But he objectifies himself. He's saying, this is, this is ultimately who I always have been. But now you can really see it. This one single event was what each event of my life has been. And we, at the foot of the cross, you try to say something negative about yourself the usual adjectives and images. Go ahead. As you maybe carry his cross or, or watch him being questioned by people and officials, Herod, and the people that wanted to get rid of him. But in Luke, I'd like to highlight the Luke chapter 22, verse 24. It's right after the time in the upper room, the Last Supper, and they're on their way out to pray. They're heading towards the Garden of Olives. And a dispute arises among them. And I'd like you to watch what is the dispute about at this very sacred time. And he turns to them and he says, which is the greater, the one who sits at table or the one who serves? This is not the one who sits at table, but I am among you as one who serves. Jesus is objectifying himself, saying this is who I have been my whole life and this is who I am going to be. I am your servant and you have to let me serve you and you have to let my interior be part of yours so that you are at service of others, especially the sinners especially the injured, especially the excluded. And so we are the disciples. And we stand with Jesus. And we stand with the accusers. And we stand with the apostles, the disciples who run away. <clears throat> Why? Because it was the easy thing to do. They did not want to be associated with a loser, and neither do we. We hate losing, we hate being associated with losers. So we watch and listen. Let Jesus look at us. That's why we can't, we can't hurry through these, this exercise of the third week. It's too precious. The basic, Universal, universal fear is of being rejected and excluded.
abandoned. We all know what that is. We want to be invited. We want to be accompanied. We want to be loved. And Jesus is the loser. Indeed, Peter especially, he becomes the winner. No, I, I don't know him. I can't be associated with a loser. And so these prayers really, as always, are prayers of the third week. Uh, they're, they're, they're with our yeses and our noes. Yes, I will be with you. No, I can't be with you. I've got my excuses. I've got my fears. I don't want to be abandoned. Can, can I accompany you? But can I take the Jerusalem bypass? Can I come and go around and meet you at Easter? No. See, in the exercises, we spend some time on the election. Whatever we choose to follow Jesus eventually will take us into Jerusalem. Eventually will take us to being misunderstood, objected to, criticized. We are identifying with a Jesus who both loses and wins in the long run. But we fear it. And we have to pray with our fears. We have to pray the second maxim that the, the uh, virtues of solidarity, of fidelity, the, the virtue of patience and suffering, those virtues are very seldomly accompanied by the feeling of those virtues. When you are patient, you're not first in line. You're patient when you're third and the persons ahead of you have coupons and can't find your credit cards. You don't feel patient. You feel impatient, but that is the virtue. And Jesus lived as a human being. Remember, he was a human being. He lived not experiencing the feeling of fidelity. And he prayed, could this, could this pass? And why? Because as a human being, he, was, he knew he was in hot water. He was in trouble. Do we want to be with Jesus all the time? Unfortunately, no. There's too much humanity in us. And he dies to raise that humanity. And we are accompanied with him standing there, feeling he really does love us. And let yourself be loved at the foot of the cross. Yes, we want to run away and sneak away and excuse ourselves away. Sure. He knows that. He knows the apostles. And he keeps searching for them. And he sees Peter. Mark ran away. The others went to hiding. Jesus, allow yourself to be looked at and looked for. We are the sought for. And from the throne of the cross, in John's gospel, it's a throne. He looks and sees us. And his interior hasn't changed. He is still receptive, passionately receptive to us. We pray to be compassionate as he is compassionate with us. So pray with the scriptures that are available, the Gospels, the Isaiah 52 and 53, what we call the suffering servant. They're very helpful. We listen to his words. Can they be our words? We watch his actions and we reflect on ourselves, but not negatively, hopefully. His grace is still among us, changing us, that we might always be obedient to his love for us. The culmination of the cross 
is maybe in the second annotation. Intimacy is really only intimacy when fruitfulness is intended. The dying of Jesus, the falling into the earth, is meant as an intimate relationship with humanity and divinity. The vertical and the horizontal meet at the center where Jesus is. The humanity and the divinity is meant to be fruitful in his life and in the life of the church and in the life of every member in the church, those who believe, those who believe in what he says we are. Not just what we're going to be, but what we are with our yeses and nos, his arms, horizontal in an embrace of time and space, you and me. The vertical, that he is of the earth and of divinity too. He suffered as a human being. So we pray quietly, slowly, not making resolutions, letting it be received, letting our hearts be patient, passionate, with compassion, receptivity, to myself and his love for us and compassionate with his brothers and sisters in whatever condition of winning or losing we might be asked to receive them. The poem. I know thee as my God and stand apart I do not know thee as my own and come closer. I know thee as my father and bow down before thy feet. I do not grasp thy hands as my friends. I stand not where thou comest down and ownest thyself as mine, there to clasp thee by my heart and take thee as my comrade. Thou art the brother among my brothers. But I heed them not. I divide not my earnings with them. Thus, sharing my all with thee. In pleasures and in pain, I stand not by the side of men, and thus stand by thee. I shrink to give up my life and thus do not plunge into the great waters of life. 